Holy the city. Just revitalized. Started riding with right. I don't know why I've never done it before. I know it's a good thing to do, give blood to the lame blood center, but until now I found more excuses than reasons. Greetings, Rick. Thank you for coming in today. You're welcome. Now I'm stuck, excuse the pun. The entire Rick Dancer TV show is centered around blood donations and the Lane Blood Center. <laughs> Whose idea was this anyway? I'll blame the videographer. He's behind the camera, he's not gonna tell. Anyway, let's get started. The first thing you do after you get your paperwork filled out is you go into a room and talk about that paperwork. You can't come in there with me, so you have to stay out here. What you can do while I'm back there is watch this first story we did for you. Tonight's whole show is about recycling in one way or another, whether it's recycling products for goodwill, or recycling your blood, or recycling old commercial and industrial land. That's the first story, brownfields. We got a young man from Springfield, Andreas, to help us with this story because there's a Spanish version, and I don't speak Spanish, and he does. Here's the report we put together, and I'll be back. This is a brownfield. Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. I'm Andres Herrera. We had no idea what a brownfield was until we started doing this story and looked into it. Brownfields are very important to our community. Here's why. If Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County are going to create the best place for future generations to live and thrive, Recycling old commercial and industrial sites will be an important component. There are sites throughout the region that are underused and could be very valuable to all of us. A project is underway to identify brownfields in Lane County. In order for this community to grow economically, we have to have uh, uh, sites that, that people can build on and that jobs can be located on, and we're really limited. This is a brownfield. A brownfield is a property that um, is uh, compromised by either real or perceived environmental contamination. Right now it's unclear how many reusable brownfields are out there. Most of these brownfields are abandoned or underutilized, but have huge potential for reuse. Brownfields could have downsides for property owners. And the fear from a property owner obviously is cost and liability. What, it, what is the cost of cleaning it up and what is my liability in the case that some of that con contamination may have creeped over into an adjacent property. A nearly $700,000 grant from the Environmental Protection Agency is the first step in a pilot program that is underway. Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County are working together on this project. The biggest obstacle we have is really going to be the working with the private property owners. There's a lot of perceptions that are somewhat negative when you start identifying and talking about brownfields and contamination. We'll be building a new brew house and fermentation space and cellar area which will create the beer which will then pipe back across to our existing brewery for packaging. Ninkasi Brewery is in the process of redeveloping a brownfield near its Whitaker plant. This building will be torn down, we'll maintain uh, a truck access here, but basically all of the lot and building area that currently exists will be turned into a uh, facility, an enclosed facility for producing more beer. An environmental study shows some contamination on the property. A lot of it has to do with our desire to be in this neighborhood, um, our desire to use this property in conjunction with our existing location and really um, to turn something that you know maybe wouldn't have another use otherwise into a more productive site. Sequential fuel is built on what used to be a brownfield. It took years and plenty of planning, money, and cooperation between local agencies and the Department of Environmental Quality to make this property what it is today. Generally brownfields are going to be in urban areas, they're going to be um, related to neighborhoods. Um, you know, so they're areas that we drive by every day that are a part of our communities and a lot of times because they're brownfields, um, that means nobody wants to touch them, nobody wants to get involved with them. Lane County partnered with Sequential Fuel to assist in the process and redevelopment of this site. Neighbors should be informed and involved in this process. So getting that site back up into productive use for the community also means it's generating tax income uh, for the local government, which is important. Really what we're doing is recycling uh, former commercial and industrial land, and that fits in perfectly with what, what this region is all about. The first phase of this project is to identify brownfields. 
What are you not doing with this project? Uh, we are not uh, whistleblowing. We're not uh, uh, trying to find you know property owners and find them or anything like that. We're really this is really a a, a project where we're looking to stimulate some economic development activity, create jobs, add value to properties that right now don't have a lot of value, don't have a lot of taxable value. They aren't really contributing to the community in that they're either they're either vacant or underutilized. Once brownfields are identified and assessed, the next phase of the project would be to try to find funding for cleanup. What's exciting about this is not only that there's all this job creation development potential, but to see something that's not being, that's not making a contribution to the community turned into something that is, is a very exciting prospect. Sequential says it's worth it. The two choices are embrace it, uh, make it a positive change agent, uh, and do everything that that entails or, or don't, and it's only going to get worse. So you may have a question. There's a phone number and a website you can visit for more information. Throughout the show tonight, while we're giving blood, we're also going to be introducing you to some other recycling programs. This first one is about why you should not have a garage sale. The top four reasons. Watch. Why do you put yourself through it? You know what I'm talking about. You thought you'd just put a few things out for a garage sale and then he shows up. You take 50 cents for that? The negotiator, the bargainer, the cheapskate. How about a nickel for all this? Negotiation is sport to this guy. Okay, how much for all this? 20 bucks. Uh, three. Who let him out anyway? Come on, 850, 875, 885. Why did you do it? Would you take three bucks for that? You knew he'd show up. How much for this sign? It's not for sale. He always shows up. What about this fishing pole up here? So how much for all these tools and, and this gas? It's not for sale. Now he knows where you live. Hey, so what about this computer in here? Oh, wow, look at this lamp. Look at this lamp. You should have taken it to Goodwill. Your stuff is going to end up there anyway. Man, that guy is annoying, and I hear that all the time. I'm sure you're very surprised by that. A lot of people have asked me, since I told them I was going to come in and give blood, is, Rick, you had prostate cancer, so can you do that? And you have to be cancer-free for one year before you can donate blood, and I've been cancer-free for two years. My oncologist says I'm fine and good to go. One of the major reasons that I'm in here today is because we did a story for the Lane Blood Center on a woman named Nancy Troutman. Watch. I'm Nancy, Nancy Troutman. I'm a nurse here at Sacred Heart River Bend. I've been with Sacred Heart for 21 years. My position here at Sacred Heart is a RN, and I do work the pre-op. I get people ready for surgery. In January, my life was turned upside down. I got a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. It was the second cancer site in two years. I had breast cancer also that was diagnosed in March of 2010. In the last six months, since January 3rd, I've had three transfusions. The second transfusion happened in March. I was in bed. I couldn't get out. My family kept bringing me food. I had no desire to eat. Just, I had no desire to do anything. I was just so tired. I got my chemotherapy, but I also got a blood transfusion. The next day, I was up, I was moving, I was playing with the grandkids. I don't know if you've ever played Hungry Hippos with little boys, but it's not quite a full contact sport, but there were marbles flying everywhere and lots of laughter and giggles. I was so happy to be part of it, that I could actually enjoy being and doing with the young men, with my grandsons, instead of laying in bed, hearing everything and being left out of everything. To me, it is an improvement in the quality of my life. I can't tell you how thankful I am to whoever donated those units because it took me from, I was, it, it wasn't life-threatening. I wasn't gonna die if I didn't have it, but it took me from not being able to do the things I wanted to do to being a more productive, a happier person. I want to be able to participate in life. I don't want to be an outsider. When I was so tired, I couldn't do that, and that hurt my heart. It made me sad when I had to tell her 
Honey, I can't come to your game. I'm just too tired tonight. There's more reasons to get blood than just an accident. I've met so many people, even at the uh, infusion center, getting blood that it's their main life. They go there every six weeks, every eight weeks, and that's what they do to keep going. It has given my life a positive twist. It's made me want to play Hungry Hippos, even though marbles fly everywhere, <laughs> um, to be able to go swimming with the boys or go to wildlife safari or something, you know, just to be able to continue to live instead of survive. I do want to survive. I'm not ready yet to just sit in a chair and not do anything. I still, I love my career and I love life in general and I want to be here. And the blood helps. Absolutely, it has helped me. I'm hoping not to need any more, but you know, you do what life hands you. So, if I were able to, I would be donating now. I did in my 20s, but I haven't in a long time and I can't tell you why. Just not something I thought about, but it sure is on my mind, mind now. Thirty-eight percent of the population is eligible to donate blood. In Lane County, that's about 125,000 people. But only seven percent right now actually donate, and I was one of them until right now. One of the things people are afraid of is they think it's going to take a long time. The whole process from start to finish is about 45 minutes, but the actual blood draw is only about 5 to 10 minutes. All right, we're back to Goodwill. The third reason you should never have a garage sale. It's fast, it's quick, and it's easy. Watch. Think of all the stuff at your garage sale that you know won't sell. I mean, what are you going to do with all those candles and crayons? We know what to do with them. Goodwill recycles them and makes them into new candles and put folks to work at the same time. What about all that darn yarn? You'll try to sell it. It won't sell. Or oh, those matchbox cars. We bundle and package the stuff you can't sell and put people to work. Do you really want to have a garage sale? You should just take it to Goodwill. We know what to do with it. It's going to end up here anyway. The last two reasons are still coming. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Look me in the eye. You know this is a project we work on a lot. This month of September is proclamated by many cities all over Lane County as Look Me in the Eye Month. It's a time to pay attention to people with disabilities, to look them in the eye, to, to not walk by and ignore them. Take a look at this commercial we produce for them. Her name is Vicki Anderson. I like lots of people. She loves to sew. She makes beautiful rugs. The message is we're smart. Just because we're disabled doesn't mean that we can't do something. Sometimes Vicki feels ignored or marginalized. The Look Me in the Eye campaign gives her value. Don't make fun of us just because we're different than you. People look past her. She sees them, but they don't seem to notice her. Look me in the eye means look us in the eye and see it from our point of view. Vicki has so much to offer, if only we'd stop and acknowledge her. To support this effort and learn more, go to lookmeintheeye.org, sponsored by Connects Auto Parts. In tonight's water cooler, a young man who speaks on behalf of the Look Me in the Eye campaign. He speaks very frankly about how people treat him, what they see, and how he feels about that. Here's tonight's water cooler. So Nick, tell me what the, the, the weirdest thing is that people have said to you since you are in a wheelchair. Probably the weirdest thing someone has said to me is the fact they asked me if I wanted a walking cane because they thought I could just get out of this chair and start walking. Do people treat you differently because you're in a wheelchair? Yes. Um, the number one thing I probably hate the most is when people, they see me, so they start talking to me in this really high-pitched baby voice. No. Yes. So what does that make you feel like? It makes me feel probably stupid. Um, 
Like I'm not a human being, like I'm not a person. Um, well, tell me something, tell me something. With Look Me in the Eye, this campaign that we have going on for Look Me in the Eye, what is that, what is that supposed to mean for someone like yourself? It's supposed to mean for someone like myself to be seen as a person and not just for the community to see me as a person and not just the guy in a wheelchair. Because what does that feel like when somebody sees you as just a guy, just Nick in a wheelchair? They don't even know your name, just a guy in a wheelchair. It, it makes me feel like, I've, like I'm useless to them, like I'm just another Joe. Like you can just forget ever knowing me because they don't want to take the time to get to know me and it just makes me feel horrible, terrible. Now cities all over Lane County are joining in and signing a proclamation to say September's Look Me in the Eye Month. What does that say to you? That's awesome. Of course, a whole month, I think it could be every day, you know, but a month is a great start. What does that say to you? Does it give you value? Does that say to you that you have value? Yes, definitely. It gives me hope. It gives me a meaning to do stuff like this, to be a part of Look Me in the Eye. It gives me a meaning to do this. So when you talk to people like myself, if you see people like me, what's the, what's the thing you could tell me that I need to do when I see someone in a wheelchair? What's the first thing I could do? The first thing you could do is, that, is simply ask them their name. Start acting, start treating them like a person. Is that the hardest thing for you? I would, I would, yes, definitely. Because at the same time, I want them to see me as a person, but I would think when you first know, when you first get to know me, I'm so guarded in letting my feelings being known. Why? Why? Because I would because when you start to tell them about yourself, they start to think, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna show sympathy, not empathy for this person. You don't want people to feel sorry for you. There's nothing yeah. to feel sorry for you about. Right. Just want them to know who you are. Right, definitely. So tell me, um, tell me the Costco story when you were at the store. Okay, um, I was at Costco oh, about two weeks ago, and this guy had his shopping cart, and I'm standing right in his pathway. But instead of, because I'm looking for something, and instead of asking me to please, you know, he's instead of asking me to please move or he's coming through, he just decides to take his cart and forced his way through the chair. So I had to move no matter what. He didn't say anything. He just kind of looked at me with this disgusted look and then just kept moving. And you felt like? A, not a human being. I felt like a, just a, a food cart, if you will. You know, a, a, just a piece of furniture. Hey Nick, thank you so much for talking to us on the water cooler and uh, telling us what you're thinking and what you yeah. feel. We appreciate it. Thank you. And look me in the eye, right? Yeah. Okay. We'll be back. We want to thank the folks at McKinsey Mist Naturally Pure Artesian Water for sponsoring the water cooler. My wife was at the store the other day and she picked up a bottle of different water and she brought it home, she tasted it, and she said to me, this isn't McKinsey Mist, is it? And I'm not making that up. That's really the truth. She notices the difference in the taste of the water and you will too. The second to the top reason you should not have a garage sale has to do with your time. How valuable is your time? How much do you actually make in a garage sale? Don't figure it out. We did it for you. Hey, Aaron, come on, get your pool. Let's go fishing. You and me, come on, let's go down the river hey, and go fishing. Hey, honey, you got this, right? I can go. No, you are not leaving. Oh, that's right. You're having a garage sale. But while I'm out fishing, you'll be making thousands and thousands of dollars, right? So I looked it up online. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the median income for a single person in Oregon is roughly $26,000 a year plus some change. Divide that by 52 weeks, you come up with $503 a week. Divide that by 40 hours a week, and you come up with $12.58 an hour. So you spend four hours setting up. Then you have two days of actually working the garage sale, so that's 16 hours when you're watching people paw through your stuff. Then roughly clean up to, let's say, four hours. Now you've got 24 hours tied up in your sale. Multiply that by 12.58, that's the dollars per hour you're making. 
you come up with $301.92. So what do you think you make at a garage sale average? It's between $500 and $700. So let's say you make $600 at a garage sale. Let's take the $600 and we will subtract the $301.92 that cost you to work the garage sale. Come up with a total of $298.08. Was it worth it? Less than $300? You should have just taken it to Goodwill. They know what to do with it. It's going to end up there anyway. Tonight's restaurant is a great find. My wife got these coupons in the mail for Ranchito Grill. We tried it, loved it, went back, loved it again. Then I told one of my friends who I said I wouldn't use Steve's name on here, so I'm not going to. He went there and tried it. He's a food snob. He texts me from the restaurant to tell me, Rick, I love this food, and you will too. Watch. What I love about this business is the people. I'm a people person, so I love to interact with people, and I love to make people feel good. So one of the ways, you know, is obviously with food, you know, because when people taste something that is really good and really authentic, you know, and have a really good service, you know, they feel good. So that's what we're passionate about is people. We really care about people. What I will tell you, you know, about our food is that we prepare everything from scratch. So we make sure we hire people that have the passion for making food. That's one of the ingredients. The other one, we make sure that our recipes, they use the ingredients that we tell them to use. And we, before we uh, put it to the market, we make sure we test, you know, try it, you know. So we make our food from scratch, and people that we have as employees, they really care about how the, the, the food tastes. So they make sure that it's really good, authentic Mexican food. The only Americanized part, you know, on these recipes are the melted cheese over. Because uh, people here like the melted cheese, you know. And in Mexico, we don't use that. But uh, the, the flavor, in the recipes and the ingredients, we use, you know, all Mexican uh, ingredients. But uh, the only thing is uh, Americanized is just to melt the cheese over. On some of the items like enchiladas or burritos, but like, like the carne asada, we use, you know, Mexican seasoning to make sure that the flavor stays up as a Mexican dish. The golden rule is, you know, obviously to treat others as you like to be treated. So when we start the business, the business is the same way. You know, you just need to treat others as you like to be treated. So we train them how to take care of the guests, how to make sure the quality of the food is coming out. Because from that, it depends everything, you know. If you don't bring a quality food, then you're done. People love the way the food tastes. They cannot find, you know, this kind of taste, you know, in town. You know, even though it's a Mexican restaurant and the menu can be similar to so-and-so, you know, but when they taste the food, they can tell the difference. You know, there's something in it that they cannot tell what it is, but it's uh, more flavorful, you know, more, uh, I, I don't know, well, they, they can really tell that it's authentic Mexican food. It's not just like any other. And we put some quotes in the wall, you know, different quotes and all this, because in Mexico, and in, in a little town, our grandparents and parents always use quotes to talk to us. So we just took some quotes from here from America so we can mix, you know, like uh, our tradition with the American tradition. I will ask everybody to come, you know, and give us a chat. And I make sure that I talk to them, you know, if they don't like it, I pay for it, you know. I'm very confident on um, our food, you know, because we eat it every day and we don't get tired. So I'm almost done with the blood donation, and a lot of people think, gosh, I'm scared because I'm giving a pint of blood. But the average adult has between eight and 10 pints of blood, so you're not gonna miss it. You have to take it easy, no exercise for the next day, drink lots of fluids, but you're not gonna miss it.
Okay, finally, the moment you've been waiting for. Goodwill is the original recycler. They recycle products. They recycle people's lives. They do it all. What is the number one reason you should not have a garage sale? Her name is Rachel. The number one reason you don't want to have a garage sale is not about the time it takes, the money you won't make, or the irritating wheeler dealer who always shows up. Would you take three bucks for that? Nope, not even close. Oh my gosh, Tweety Bird! <laughs> hey, Tweety Bird! Sassy. The number one reason not to have a garage sale is Goodwill employee Rachel Priest and the over 4,500 other people Goodwill helped find jobs for last year. I work at Goodwill for 20 years. Yep, 20 years down the road. And I like it. The things you don't need anymore, Goodwill restores, recycles, and resells to help put people to work and pay for programs for people with barriers to employment. They want to understand about my angry problem. My angry and I'm learned is able. And... Value is recyclable. Belongings we assume are used up still provide so much goodwill at Goodwill. I want to work different jobs, like making candles, shrink wrapping, and puzzles, and bake, bake some, bake some um, toys or something, and you just bake. Yeah, I like different jobs. But one thing, it's different, and I like it, Jackie. Goodwill Industries of Lane County sees possibilities. I'm very safer. I like it. I have new, f make new friends, have old friends. Come on, you don't really want to have a garage sale. And they understand. They're like very understanding people. Just take it to Goodwill. It's going to end up there anyway, helping people. So that's it for tonight's show. I'd like to sit here and just tell you that this doesn't affect me, but it does. Um, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do, and I'm doing it because. I met Nancy, and it's a good thing to do. There's a, a website on your screen you can go to if you need to find out more about giving blood. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>